Now let's take a look at some of our mixing tools in the Fairlight page. So I'm going to open up another timeline. Here we go. And hide my media pool. And what we have here is the finished version of the scene from Hyperlight. And as you can see, this is the scene we've been working with. I'm going to go ahead and bring up my meters. Here you'll see the mixer. And notice I can make this a little bit larger if I'd like to see a larger viewer, or I can resize my mixer over there on the right. Something else you can do with your mixer before you get started is you can come over to the three dot menu right there, the options menu, and that allows you to choose what you're going to see in your channel strips. So for example, you can choose to show or hide the labels on the left hand side of your mixer, or you can go in and decide which other elements are showing, like the inputs and so on. And so any of those you can show or hide as needed while you're working. So I'm going to go ahead and leave everything set to the default where we see all the different elements. And what we're going to look at is just quickly see all of the different tracks that are available in this timeline. Now I'm going to condense the tracks so you can see there's actually a little bit more than what we need. Down at the bottom you'll see these beige tracks. And what those beige tracks are, these are some reference tracks from the actual soundtrack. So I'm just going to extend those so you can see those a little bit bigger. And so the reason it's nice to have a reference is if you're learning mixing um, or if you're starting a new type of project that you're not used to mixing that type, whether it's music or if you're mixing, let's say, a sci-fi show when you're used to doing podcasts or whatever it might be, if you have an example of a professional version of a soundtrack that's similar to what you're doing, you can use that as a reference to check your levels and also see how that mixing you know, was done and you can use that as a comparison to help you set up your levels and kind of learn the art of doing mixing yourself. And in this case, I have the soundtrack, different stems up here at the top. This is the stereo mix. Now, it is not in sync with the video, but right now this is only here to help you see if the levels are right on your system. And so I'm going to go ahead and unmute this and solo it for just a second. And this is the stereo mix so I could go to any portion of it and just check the levels to see what the levels are like in my room, how my listening levels are. And this is a good point for me to make an adjustment to those. I could do that right here and adjust my listening levels. Now obviously if your room has been professionally calibrated, you're not going to want to make any changes to that. But I'm going to go ahead and you can set this here. Also your output levels on your computer itself, you can come in here and make adjustments to those. So I'm going to go ahead and play this. What? So when you play it back, it should be at a really nice volume level for you, whether you're working with headphones or you're listening through speakers. This is the mix, so this should give you a nice opportunity to see this is going to be the loudest portion of the soundtrack, and so set up your levels to make sure that's comfortable. We also have the stems. If you look down below, I'm going to mute this track and go down, and here is my stereo voiceover stem. And you know, the one thing to remember when you're doing your deliverables, in addition to mixing all of your tracks together, is you also need to set up the constituent stems. That would be your dialogue separate from the sound effects and the music. Those all need to be in separate mixes so that they can be combined later or separated as needed for doing, whether it's the trailer or for doing different localizations where they might want to change the language. They need to be able to have the separate voice so that they can revoice it with someone else in dubbing and then mix it back in. So being able to separate those is very important. You also need an M and E mix, which is just the music and effects in one mix, which again is the whole purpose of that is to be able to add the dialogue in different languages as needed. And so as you can see, this is the dialogue only. And so I can just play a little bit of that and check my levels. Heading where? They were here. Why? And if you watch the levels, you'll see, just as you might have done in dialogue editing, we want those dialogue levels to be right there in between maybe minus 10, minus 15 in that ballpark, and that's what you'll you see in the meters speaking. as well. Of course I did. It's protocol. That exactly as we had set up. So there's our dialogue. And then, of course, you can see some of these lower tracks are reference tracks for the sound effects and for the music. So those are all in here just as a reference to help you with your levels and just as a guide for mixing. But we don't actually need them for doing our mix. So since I don't need these anymore, we'll go ahead and hide those tracks. So we'll go up to the index inside the tracks index and we'll come down to where 
those reference tracks are, and we can just hide those if we need to. And then I can just hide my index. So now that those are hidden and we have everything set up exactly as we need to, we can actually get into the mixing portion of our project. Now, the first thing we wanna do is make sure that every, all the levels are set up right. So let's take a look at our mixer. And generally, whenever you start mixing, you want to make sure that your levels on your mixer are all at set to unity, meaning that none of the levels have been changed yet. You want to start with a clean slate so that you can then make be the one to adjust the levels. Now, everything in theory has been set up in the track, so the level should be pretty good. It's now you're determining how loud each track is and how well they blend together. And so that's just balancing those tracks. So if I look, just at a glance, when I'm looking at the mixer, you'll see that I can see that the levels are a little bit lower. The MedLab has been lowered. Both of these MedLab tracks are not at their default. And same with the drone. So I'm going to go ahead and change those so that I can be the one to make those adjustments instead of whoever might have set this up for me. So to reset these levels, just double click on the fader. And as you can see, let me zoom in on that. If you double click on the fader, it will just reset it to Unity. There we go. And that means there no a change has been applied. That's what the zero is there. And so these are all ready to go. So all of my different tracks. Now, obviously, if this was the real soundtrack, I would have maybe 150 or more um, tracks here. In this case, this is just more for an example. So the sound effects are all in one track already. Same with the music. And the dialogue is going to be in its constituent parts. This is still all separated. Um, but it's enough for you to get the idea of what you'll need to do. So your tracks have all been edited. The clips are all balanced within the tracks. We've set the levels. Everything is zero. And now we can start determining things based on how they actually sound. You'll use your eyes watching the meters, but you're also always using your ears. And as you make different changes, you'll be constantly massaging those levels and adjusting them as needed until you get what you want. It's never a set it and forget it when it comes to mixing sound. And so let's start off with just playing a little bit of this from the beginning. Um, I'm going to just play it in full screen. I'm pressing P to play in full screen. So when I play this, one of the first things I'm noticing is, and I'll just hit escape to get back, is that the drone is a little heavy heavy-handed. I mean, we're inside of a ship, yes, but it shouldn't be that loud, right? Uh, we're not in the engine room of the ship. So the hint of drone, I get it, but not that much. Also, the sound effects are a little bit too heavy as well. It's just too much. Um, a little bit is great, but those are just too loud. And so let's go ahead and adjust those. I'm going to mute both of the MedLab effects so that we don't hear those, and we're going to start with just that drone sound. And just use your ears and you're going to come over here to that fader, and as you listen, you're just going to find a level that's good for you, where it's not too prominent. I will tell you now that it will not be yellow. Do you see the meters, the colors? Usually that area in the yellow is set for your dialogue, right? You want to make sure your dialogue's sitting in that range between minus 10 and minus 15. Your sound effects should only be there if it's something that's loud and it's prominent. Definitely not a background sound, unless they might happen to be standing right next to the engine and we need it to be that dominant. Otherwise, it should be much lower. So go ahead and lower those levels. We'll just start playback and I'll lower that. So you want to hear it, but not too much of it. And so I just did that by muting um, the med lab effects because I didn't want those to be clouding what I'm hearing and that way I could focus on the drone. So find a level that you're happy with and we're done with that drone. Again, at any time you think it's not present enough or you need more of it, you can always do that. Now, if you want to, one way that you could check to see if your level is pretty good is you can listen to with and without it in there by starting playback and just mute the track and then unmute it and you'll see what it, you'll hear. Am I even hearing it or not? So I'm going to start playback. So that way you can tell whether or not you're actually hearing your drone sound. And that's just by toggling on and off the mute. So let's now tackle these MedLab effects. Now here's the thing about the MedLab. Let's go back and look at the video again. I'm going to go back to the beginning. And I'll go to full screen for this for a minute. Is we've got Philip on a MedLab. Right? He's sitting there. He's got a respirator on. So we want to hear that respirator. And you can't have a MedLab without the beeping 
heart monitor, right? So those are two sound effects that we're using, but they're all part of one device. So the goal is to make it feel as if it's coming from the room, it's an actual device that's creating these sounds. So it shouldn't feel like it's this massive thing, right? It shouldn't be way off in the corner somewhere. It should feel like it's part of the space. And so, and I'm actually gonna solo those two tracks so we'll only hear those for this moment. And I'll go back to full frame. There's the sounds. All right, so we have Philip on his med lab, and as you can see, we get an idea, but we only see the mask at this moment. Now, if we go a little bit further down, just scrubbing across there, we can see a little bit more of the machinery, but we still can't get a sense of scale. So we'll just look a little bit further. There we go. Now you can actually see the machine in the background. So it's really this, and there's the computer. So all of the sound we're hearing is coming from this little space right here. All right, so we need to keep that in context as we're crafting what the sound is gonna be like. And so it shouldn't be um, this massive thing, but we do want it to sound like one item. So keep that in mind as we play this through. And the first thing is we wanna be able to adjust the levels on this, it's also too loud. Now unfortunately, if you look at the mixer, just zoom in on this a little bit. If I look at the mixer, we have two faders for our MedLab, right? We have one, and then we have the other one, and I'd really like to be able to use one fader for both. It's one machine, why can't I have just one fader? Now because these are both mono sounds, I can actually link those together into a stereo linked group, and that will give me a single fader, which would solve our problem. So let's try that. I'm gonna come over here, let me reset those faders. And all I have to do to link this group is to go up to the Fairlight menu and choose Link Group. And when I do that, I can choose any set pairs of my mono tracks if I wanted to. In this case, MedLab 1 and MedLab 2, and then I'll click the link button. And that's just linked these together. See how it's got a little badge on it? These have now been linked as a stereo pair. If I close this up and take a look at my mixer, let's peel that open, select the MedLab, and you'll see there's now a single track. It's a stereo track for the MedLab. I don't see MedLab 2 anymore in my mixer because it's hidden. Whenever you link tracks together, only the first of those link tracks, only channel one is the one that's gonna show up. However, they're all linked together. You'll see a little band right here on the left next to the two MedLab um, tracks. Those were mono tracks that shows that they're linked together. And you also see a little badge or band around them as well up here. And so now that I know that they've been selected, that's great. They have a single fader. Let's listen and see, did we accomplish what we wanted to? We have a single fader. Now we can adjust the volume level. Let's listen. Okay. You notice something strange about this, okay? We totally broke it. <laughs> Before, it sounded like one machine. Um, sort of, it was just like, it did sound like one thing because it was two mono tracks, they were playing equally out of both speakers, the left and right speaker because they were mono. Well, now that we've linked them together, it's treating it as a stereo pair so that the left channel, the heart monitor is playing out of the left and the respirator is playing out of the right. So it actually sounds like they are on opposite sides of the room, which is exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do. So we'll need to fix that with our panning controls and we'll deal with that in just one second. Before we do, I'm just gonna take a little side trip here and show you a little bit more information about the panning and what we can do to control panning between stereo and mono. And then we'll go in here and we'll fix it. So keep in mind what our goal is. I'm gonna unsolo this track. And let's just step one track to the right to our drone track instead. Come over here to the drone track, which happens to be stereo. And what I'd wanna do is just select a little piece of this track. I'm just going to mark an in point and an out point. It's just a drone. I'm going to go ahead and raise the level of the drone for this moment. I'll bring it back down. I'm going to bring it back up to Unity just so we can hear it nicely. And I'll make sure my loop playback is turned on and I'm going to just loop playback of this while we do a little experiment with the sound. What I really want you to do is see it in the meters. That's the most important part. Um, so we'll do that. And I think because of the screen resolution that I have to use for um, doing this demo, I think I do want to hide a couple of things on my mixer just so I have a little bit more room to see my channel strip. So I'm going to come up to the three-dot menu in the top right. I'm going to go ahead and hide my inputs 
which will give me a little bit of extra space there for my faders. There we go. And I don't think I have to hide anything else. That was just the main thing. Just give it a little bit more room. There we go. And then what I'm going to do is I've got my drone and I want you to watch the meters. Okay. Now with the drone, if I were to play that, you'll see, I'll go ahead and dim the sound because we don't really need to hear it so much. I want you to watch those faders and you'll see how it's coming out of both speakers, right? Not quite equally because this is stereo. So um, it's, it's a stereo drone. So you'll see it's kind of dancing back and forth on both, but you'll see it's the exact same thing on both the drone track and the main. Now up here in the pan controls, zoom in on that, in the pan controls there, there we go, up here at the top, you'll see that there's these two dots. Those represent the speakers, okay, or where the source of that sound is. And this in the middle is showing you just the balance between your two speakers. And so as I'm listening to this, watch your main, because if I change this to the left, notice that now it's heavier on the left side than the right. I'm still hearing the drone out of both speakers, but you see how it's a little bit heavier on the left than the right side. I could also drag it over here towards the far right. And now it's much heavier or louder on the right side, but it's still coming out of both speakers at the same time. I can never get it fully one or the other based on the fact that it is stereo. Now we have, let me bring it back to the middle now, my panning back to the center, and you can see it's still doing it in a both spaces. Now we have a meter that's really helpful to kind of visualizing your sound field and how our perception is of the sound. And that is our surround analyzer. And I just happen to already have that plugin is sitting right here on our main. So if you come up here to the main, you'll see there's a plugin on this and you can click that to open it up. And this is your surround analyzer. Now, if I ever wanted to add this myself, you can just come down here to your effects slot and click here and choose metering surround analyzer, oops, metering surround analyzer, there it is. And you can pull it up that way. It's also located in our effects library because it is one of the effects that comes with it right here, surround analyzer. Okay. Hide the effects library. So I'm gonna go ahead and open that up. And this is often called the jellyfish <laughs> because it looks a little bit uh, like a jellyfish. It kind of gives you this nice shape or blob that shows the, um, the radiation of the sound basically in the sound field, how we perceive it. And if you look at it, here's the center, right? This is your location as the listener. And this would be the left and the full right speakers and how we perceive the sound whenever we hear it. And so let me just play this again, looping playback option in the forward slash. And as I loop playback, let me just move this over a hair. Okay, so for the drone, so if I drag it all the way to the left, you'll see that I'm hearing it definitely more heavy on the left, but it's still getting quite a bit of that sound is coming on the right-hand side. Okay, now if I go the other direction, all the way to the right, you'll see that now it's definitely leaning very heavy towards the right. However, we're still getting quite a bit of the sound also out of the left speaker, which you also can see with the other meters. So, you know, if I were do doing surround sound, whether it was 5.1 or 7.1 surround, you would be able to move this sound all over that surround space with the listener in the center. So, okay, we can see what our limitations are when it comes, I'm going to stop playback when we're listening to it in stereo. Now, what I'm going to do temporarily is let's go over to this drone and right click, and I'm going to change that drone track to mono just for the moment for this example. And when a track is mono, it's going to come out equally from both speakers. So as I, let's go ahead and make sure that we've reset this. It's now pan dead center because that is a mono signal. If I play that loop to playback again, option forward slash, notice it's now coming out equally out of both left and right channels. Notice there's a single fader right here for the drone and look how it's exactly the same on both channels when you're looking at your main. Let's pan it to the far left. And this time I get almost the entire signal over on the left. Notice there is nothing coming out of that right channel now, nothing. So this way I have the ability to place something in a very specific place within my um, speaker area or within the, the range. And let's go to the other direction, all the way to the right. And once again, I can now hear the sound coming out and I can see that it's fully coming out of only the right channel. And you can see that right there on your jellyfish too. So. I'll zoom in on that slightly so you can see that a little bit more. And as you can see, that's it coming all the way 
far right. There it is. Okay. So let's pull that back. And again, the jellyfish, it's actually called the surround analyzer, but that's just showing it to you visually. So I'm going to go ahead and make my drone track stereo again, change that track back to stereo. There we go. <laughs> and I'll close up my sound surround analyzer. That was just to give you some visuals on the differences between working with stereo and working with mono and as far as being able to actually place a sound. So let's get back to our issue at hand. Let's go back to the med lab and let's solo that track, unsolo our drone. And by the way, let's go ahead and lower the drone back to wherever you had it before so it's not too loud. You can fix that next time we do playback. And if I listen to my med lab, okay, I'm watching my med lab right now, my med lab sound. Let's go ahead and bring up um, on that track, let's bring up the panning. And instead of working with the pan right here in this small panner, double click on the pan control here in the mixer and you will get the full pan window. And what that will do is it will allow us to make adjustments to this. These are all the different controls that we have for the panning. I'll just start loop playback here. And this is our signal so I can pan to the left or I can pan to the right. But what we really want to do is we want to make it sound like it's a mono signal so we have much more control of where the placement is. And again, we want it to sound like it's coming from this machine right here in the background on our visuals. So one of the first things we could do is adjust the spread. And I'll just zoom in on that a little bit. Right here, you'll see spread right there, the full. And so we have, move this over a little bit. Right here, we have the spread. So you can see there's the full spread where the speakers are in the far right and far left corners, left and right. And this is where we're adjusting the signal, but still it's gonna be in the far left and right. But if we change the spread from full to point, all of a sudden, look what happens. We're reining that in and if we pile that right there in the middle to point, PNT is point, this is full, then it's gonna sound like it's a mono signal. Now all of a sudden, even though it's two different tracks, it's gonna feel like it's coming out of one position on our screen. And so jump back out, and now that I've made it a point, I'll start playback, and if you look right here on our main, see how we're getting equal signal out of both speakers? Even though it's two totally different sounds in the left and right, we're now getting similar to a mono signal, and that allows us to put this wherever we need it to. And in fact, he's over here on the left, so I can just park it right there on the left if I wanted to. There it is. Or I could even put it right here in the middle, because if I ever go to a surround mix 5.1, then this would radiate all throughout, and this would feel like more kind of omnipresent if I wanted to. It's still in the center either way. Um, the other thing I'd like to do is maybe spread this out a little bit. It's not exactly a point. A point might be a very small source like a watch that's making noise, a very small source on screen. This is obviously not that small. It's this big, right, if you look at the screen. So in order to make it a larger signal, we can come over here. We can adjust the spread a little bit, right? And then you also have the divergence, which is right here. And that's going to be give you a sense of scale for the object you're working on. So you could have a teeny tiny little radio, or you could have a boom box sitting on top of your head. Right? And if you were using something larger, then you want to make it feel like it has more scale. Or you could have a giant speaker the size of this wall, which obviously would be a much larger signal. And so in this case, if you want to adjust the divergence, that's right here, you can make that larger, and you're going to see those little lines and that's how much it's going to be bleeding in towards the other speakers, making it feel like a larger source. And you can even look at it in more of an overhead position, if that helps. So this is now showing how the source is radiating from the center. And then so if I place it somewhere, it's now a source. And if I look at it, comparing it to the screen, it's a much larger source. It's going to feel like it's to the left, but it's also going to feel like something with some um, substance as opposed to a tiny little point source. And I can do all of that by just adjusting these few settings with my sound. So we've now fixed the med lab, although I do want to point it, put it right here in the middle. So we balance our tracks and then we do things like adjusting our panning. Now obviously the dialogue is all panned to the center, but we might also want to do something with, let's say, Ada's voice. I'm going to clear my in and out points for a minute. Um, Ada's voice, she is a computer voice, she's coming out of speakers, and those speakers are all over the place. So it's possible we want her to sound more omnipresent as opposed to 
a source because we really don't have a body for her voice. And so if we wanted to do that, let's go to her voice. One of the things we could do is we could add a plugin to her voice. And if you look on her track, I already have a plugin on there. There's a flanger, a de -esser. And if I click on this, you'll see this is a stereo width plugin. This is one of our Fairlight effects. It's right here, stereo width. And what this plugin will do is this will give you the ability to adjust the scale if it's a stereo track. And so, for example, I'll just play that back. I'm going to select that clip. So I can do loop playback. I'll make it a little larger so you can see that. We'll solo that track to we're only listening to it. And if I play it back, Ameliana Newton. Okay, so there you can hear Ameliana Newton. And if you look, right now it's just a, a fairly tight stereo, but I could also change that width to make it very narrow so it sounds like it's mono. Ameliana Newton. Or really wide. Yes. Now it feels like it's this massive signal, right, coming, fit, radiating Ameliana. through the whole room. And so you can just choose which where you want that to go to kind of give it the feel that you're looking for. And that can be done with a plugin. So just showing you different options for managing your sound and how it's interpreted within your speakers. Let's go ahead and clear that out. And so the next thing we're going to look at is now that we've done a little bit, we've our levels are balanced, assuming they're balanced on all your tracks, the relationship between the different tracks is working, and we have adjusted, make sure everything is panned as we want at least for now. Then the next thing we want to look at is some of our sweetening tools, which we have, we have EQ and we have compression for that. And, you know, there's always a spirited debate as to which comes first, EQ or compression. And, you know, compression is managing the, the levels, basically, just as you would with luminance if you're dealing with color grading. And color grading is very similar to sound grading or dealing with your audio. You work with levels, your whites and blacks would be your volume level, and then you work with the color, which is more the EQ, um, the color of the sound, or working with the different frequencies. Those would be your hues if you were working with an image. Now in this case, um, because we balanced all of the clips ahead of time, we've already done some of that work with the levels. So I'm going to start with EQ just for this example. And our EQ um, is right here on every single track already. Every track has EQ. And if you look, let me bring up my labels. There they are. And if you look at the labels on the mixer, you'll see that there is the EQ right here. I'm going to start with the Emiliana track, and we'll just show you a quick example of what the EQ looks like on that. So if I open this up, you'll see there is my EQ window that gives me the ability to adjust the EQ on her track. Now, it would help to know where her actual voice is. You know, where's the meet her voice? Most human voices are going to all fall right here in the lower mid section um, is where the main part of their voice is, and then any kind of sibilance or the high end of their voice is going to fall in that upper range. Now, what's nice about this, I'm going to hide this for just a second, is that you can actually, we have a plugin that will actually show you exactly where the voice is, and that's our noise reduction plugin. So I'm just going to add that to her track just to show you. And I'm also going to solo her track for the moment, unsolo Ada's track. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more so we can really see her clip here. We'll pick this one as the clip that we'll work with for this example. Ada, identify the person I'm speaking with. Okay, so we'll listen to her saying this particular line a few times. The level's already okay, I'm as you can see with that. But now we're going to work on the EQ. Now, if I want to see exactly where her voice falls, what you could do is come over to the effects library, and we can take the noise reduction, which is right here, noise reduction, and I'm going to put it on her track. Now, again, this is not necessary. I'm just showing you this is a nice way if you're learning about frequencies and how voices fall within the frequency range. This is a nice way to see them. So I'm going to drop it onto there. And this has a live frequency analysis right built into the noise reduction. So if I bring this over here, right now this purple area by default is what's being removed. That's the noise profile. So the first thing I would want to do is come over and reset the noise profile that's right there in your presets. Notice there is no noise profile being removed now. I have it set to manual mode, and if I wanted to start looped playback, Ada, identify the person I'm speaking what it's with. showing me now is as long as I leave this set to manual mode and there's no profile being taken out, I'm not reducing any noise, but it's showing me 
Anything in white is showing me the actual frequencies. So I can see right here, this is the meat of her voice. This is some low end happening here, but you see that's right where her voice is. I can even see where her sibilance falls, right there around 7.2. Eight, identify the person I'm speaking with. So now that I have an idea where her sound is, I can close this up. I don't even need to keep that plugin if I don't want to. I'm going to hide my effects library. It's sitting here not doing anything, not causing any issues. I could always um, turn it off if I wanted to or delete that plugin. But for now, I'll just leave it there. It's not bothering anything. And I'm going to come back to that clip that we were just working with. Now, normally when you're working with your EQ, you don't want to do it soloed. You want to do it with all the other tracks. So you can hear it in context and make sure it sounds good in context. But in this case, I'll solo it just to make it easier for you to hear for this demo. I'm going to bring up the EQ. And when we're working with the EQ, there is no perfect formula. There's no secret sauce that's going to work on every voice because all voices are different. If you're a colorist, there is no secret that will match every flesh tone. Same thing with every person's voice. And the reason that we separate every voice to its own track when we're dealing with dialogue, and even if you're mixing music, you know, your vocals all go on different tracks so that you can treat each vocal differently. Same thing here. Every voice is different. And so you find the nuances of a voice that make it unique. You might want to enhance those. Things that might be detracting are the ones that you're going to want to reduce or attenuate. And so it's just a very fine line that you work on. You never want to hit it with a hammer unless you're trying to make the voice sound bad. <laughs> so a couple of things that usually work well is, for example, I'll go over here to band one. And band one is just basically my high pass filter and it's just going to allow me to roll off some of those that low end sounds. Her voice, there was a little bit of stuff happening in here which there's generally nothing good is going to be enhancing a voice, um, anything below 80, but depends on the voice of course. So there are no absolutes, but I'm just going to go ahead and roll off just the low end you know, maybe to 80, 60 to 80, and that's it. Just going to roll that little bit off. So that's one thing I might do for her voice. And then another one is we do things called sweeping, where you'll take a nice bell curve. I'll just grab this one right here in the middle, move it all the way up to the top, just drag it all the way up, and you'll listen to her voice while you'll sweep back and forth through the meaty part of the voice, right? Right around here between, let's say, 100 and 500, right in there, and you'll be listening. And anytime you sweep across something, if it sounds, makes your eyes squint and it sounds really off, that might be something you might want to reduce a little bit. If you raise something a little bit and it sounds boxy or starting to detract from the voice, that might be an area you might want to reduce. And the idea is just make minor adjustments, just tweaking those levels as you go. So I'll just give you an example. We'll listen to the voice. Eight, identify the person I'm, I'm going to sweep with. this. Eight, identify the person I'm speaking with. 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 Right there, it's sounding Eight, a little bit boxy. And if I bring it down, Eight, identify the person I'm speaking with. Just a hair. Eight, identify it the sounds a little I'm bit better because sometimes you have a lot of things happening within the same frequency range. So by just reducing it a little bit, it'll be a little less muddy because then everything's not competing for that same space. So that sounds a little bit better. And then another one is, let me change band five to a bell curve, and I could also sweep around here and I could try to find a little bit of presence possibly. If I wanted to. Identify the person I'm speaking. Now presence is going to be just make it feel like someone's in the room with you, someone's a little bit closer to you. It's especially important if it's a super close up shot and you want to make it feel like they're right there next to you. It's a little bit breathier. There's a little bit more um, presence coming from them. So it's not, you don't want to bring in sibilance, which is going to be this excessive S's, that whistly S sounds. Instead, you're going to want to back off from that. So if you find your sibilance, just move over about three kilohertz, two to three kilohertz, and you'll be right where you want to go. So. That's fine. Eight, identify the person I'm speaking with. Eight, identify the person I'm speaking with. And I'm just going to bring it over Eight, a little bit, drop I'm it down. With. Eight, identify the person I'm speaking with. And maybe that's just a little bit of presence that I've added. So those are just a few things you can do, but you go one voice at a time. Obviously, these are the tools you can work with. Now, if you like working with lots of plugins or if you want to have many different levels of um, EQ, this is just one that happens to be built into the track, but you also have the ability in our effects library, we have our vocal channel plugin that you can use. If you apply the vocal channel plugin, it has a built-in high pass filter you can add, additional EQ, as well as compression. So if you want to add multiple layers, 
you can also do it that way as well. I'll turn that off for now. Hide my effects library. So that's EQ, and notice that once you've added your EQ, it shows up right there in the graph, so you always know which things have been affected. Now let's look at our dynamics. When it comes to sweetening, which in whichever order you're going to do these, that's another one that's really important. So let's go down to Phillips track. And what the dynamics is, it's going to adjust the balance of those peaks to the main part of your voice. And so the idea is it's just taming our peaks. And if you were thinking about dynamics, it's the same thing as your dynamic range you might have if you're working with images. What's your hottest thing? The white levels, right? And then you might want to bring those a little bit closer to your midtones if you want, or your mid, and same thing you would do here right? Your shadows and you're working with your brightness if you're dealing with images. With sound is you have to use your dynamics to kind of finesse those levels so that everything isn't all the same volume level. There is some range, just not too loud and not too quiet. And so let's go ahead and select Phillips track. We're going to go in here and open up the dynamics. And continuing to compare this to um, working with grading of images, if you look, we have four different elements in here that you can add, and these are already built into every track. So a gate is something that this is will eliminate lower levels or reduce things that are below a certain threshold. Okay, so if you have some low-level noise in a track and you want to just reduce that, you can just set the threshold to that low-level low sound, and anything below that will not be heard or will be rolled off very easily. So that's one option. That's your gate. We have an expander, and what the expander does is imagine you had a very flat image where everything is very gray, and you want to try to bright, you know, bring up your highlights and kind of give yourself a little more contrast. And so what you need to do is expand between, you know, stretch it out so that you have some things that are brighter, some that are darker. Same thing with the, with the expander is you're basically separating, you're raising the peaks and you're lowering the, uh, the low end and you're sort of doing both at the same time to expand that sound so it's not everything sitting in one little zone. Um, so that's what your expander is going to be doing. In this case, um, we'll be using the compressor right here, but we also have a limiter over here on the right. We have a limiter plug-in, which is a true peak limiter that you could put on at the end to make sure that your sound doesn't go above a certain level. In this case, the limiter, as you can see, it's a ceiling. It basically is saying nothing goes past this. So if you have a hard limit, you could set it here in the track, or you could also do that, again, with a plug-in or something on your mains later on. So it just gives you a little bit more control. I'm going to turn off my limiter, and we're just going to look at the compressor, and we're going to do this with Philips Track. I just have to find the right clip. So here we are. I'm going to come over here to Philips Track and solo it. Zoom in on his clip. Here we go. I'm just picking one that has a lot of dynamic range. As you can see, those peaks are pretty heavy right there. He's got some loud sections. He's got some quiet sections, and this has not been there's not a whole lot of keyframes that are balancing that out. Now, before, um, if you were doing like dialogue editing, you may have used some keyframes to massage those levels, but there's still a certain amount of dynamic range in there between the lower levels of the volume and the higher levels. Your goal is to keep the average of the dialogue and basically as much of the dialogue as you can between minus 10 and minus 15 dB. You want to keep it all within that little space so that all the dialogue is fairly even, even though there's still inflection, and you'll still hear some people a little bit louder and some will be quieter, if you can keep it within that range, then dialogue will be consistent throughout your entire show and from one show to the next to the next. That's why we try to keep things consistent. Otherwise, you know, if it's all over the place from one show to the next, you'll be constantly riding those levels and you won't hear anything. So if I were to look at this, I'm going to just play this little clip. I will use my range tool to select the clip and just loop playback. And what we want to watch right here is the input levels. The high play core came out of you. And I have this dim, so it's not too loud, because I'm not so worried about you hearing it as I am seeing the levels right here where the input is. The high play core came out of you. Do you see how high the peak is? It came out of cryo. And so the highest peak is way up here, and then it's coming down as low as... The high play core came out a few days ago. You know, he's talking as he's exhaling, too. So we've got quite a dynamic range there. I mean, I'm looking for a dynamic range of, you know, all of the dialogue being within three decibels, three to five decibels of each other. And this one is quite wide. And so we're way up to minus five, maybe, in the red. And then we've got stuff that's way down here, minus 18. And so the idea is to kind of tighten up that range in between those to make it a little bit easier to listen to. And so what we'll do is we'll come over here and we have to choose a threshold. 
zoom in on that a little bit so you can see it better. Right here, there's a threshold, and if you choose a threshold, what that's going to do is that's going to allow you to choose what is the level where we're going to say any vol anything that's over that amount, we're going to start compressing that using a ratio. And so in this case, we'll use minus 15. That's our nice spot where we want the dialog to sit, right, between minus 10 and minus 15. Anything over minus 15, what we'll do is we'll adjust it by a ratio. Right now, it's set to a 2 to 1 ratio. That means every two decibels over 15, minus 15, is it will be reduced and you'll only hear one. If I were to set this to, let's say, a 4 to 1 ratio, then every four decibels over, you're still only going to hear one. So it's, it's a pretty big uh, reduction. And then, of course, you can really hit it with a hammer and 20 to 1 ratio, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> let's try, let's say, a 4 to 1 ratio at minus 15-ish. And then if I play that, I play if you watch the output, you'll notice that because I lowered this anything under minus over minus 15, watch over here at the output, and you'll see the level never gets over minus 10 now. Came out crying. We did just enough of, of the compression that the levels are exactly where we need them to be. Now, if we were to compress it too much, you can always make up the gain right here. You can always add a little bit of gain to it to bring it back in case you had to, you know, reduce it. And at any point along the way, whether you're using plugins or EQ or, in this case, any of your dynamics, as you're processing, if you ever, um, if the result of that processing ever lowers the levels too much, there's always the ability to make up that gain or raise your gain back. It's called gain staging, meaning each stage along the way, you want to make sure your gain or your level is correct for your dialogue. So you're constantly watching that. And in this case, the levels are just fine. And we managed to keep it exactly where we wanted to, right there in the yellow, in that sweet spot, even though there's peaks in that dialogue. So that is compression successful. Go ahead and close that up. I'm going to clear off my in and out points. And so that's just working with our compression, um, one of many tools. Like I said, you know, it, many of you are probably already familiar with working with compressors That's or dynamics. That's just how we happen to use them here. If you look up at the top of my mixer, one of the things that's new is we have this order menu. And basically, the default is going to be effects, EQ, and then dynamics. That's F, E, and D. If I click on this, though, for each track, I could change the order. If you would rather have your EQ first, then dynamics and effects, you can change the order that way. If you'd rather have effects first, and this is the order of processing before it goes, makes it to the output. So that's really giving you an opportunity to be in control per track which, depending on what you're doing, everyone has their favorite secret sauce for how they like to order their processing for dialogue versus music and so on. Now you have the ability to do that. It's right there in your mixer. So we've set up our tracks. We have set up our dynamics. We've done our sweetening. Now let's look at, let's say we wanted to add a little bit of busing to this. Um, we need to route these things because at this moment, all we have is one main. And our main happens to be a stereo main. And I mentioned at the beginning of this section, we need to be able to break things up into the constituent parts, dialogue, music, and effects. And we also need to have an M and E, music and effects mix, that is only those elements without the dialogue. So how do we do that? Well, all we have to do is make new buses. Now, buses are just the way to get the source out, right? It's just as if it were a water flow. Signal is going to go through the tracks to the faucet, right? The faucet is your output. Um, and you can also run it through different pipes to get to the output as well. You can have it branch off three different ways and come back, just like you might with sprinkler systems or the pipes in your house. The same idea goes for your busing here. It's just routing the signal flow to get it to wherever you need. And so in this case, we're going to create some more buses that we can use to kind of control the signal flow. And I would, you would do the same thing whether you had 200 tracks or 1,000 tracks as you would if you have, in this case, like 10 tracks. So let's go up to the Fairlight menu. And this is where you can choose bus format. And this happens to be our legacy fixed busing right now. This is one of the busings where you can choose to make mains, submixes, and auxiliaries. We also have flex busing, which allows you to do flexible buses where any bus can be patched any way that you want to, and it can be used to go from bus to bus, bus to track, 
track to bus, and so on. But in this case, we'll use the legacy fixed busing. Um, this is just traditional busing, and it, you can do the same idea using either bus method. So right now I have my main, which is just a stereo main. Let's make another one. I'm just going to click main again, and that gave me my second main. And this one's going to be that M and E main that I mentioned before. I don't want it to be mono. It should be stereo as well. If I was mixing for 5.1, then obviously I would be making 5.1 buses and so on. In this case, I'll just do stereo for this example. I'll go ahead and change the color as well to something different, just so we can tell the difference between our M and E and our stereo main. Okay. Then I also want to make some submix buses. Now the submixes will be our dialogue, our music, and our effects. So let's make three of those. One, two, and three. Dialogue is a um, mono signal right now, so we could do it as mono or stereo, depending on what we need. Um, in this case, I'll go ahead and keep it mono, and we'll call this um, dial, leave it mono, and I'm going to just change it to orange. Our muse, our, let's do our effects next, so SFX for sound effects. We'll make that stereo, and I'll make it purple for no reason. And the third one will be our music, and also stereo, and that one I'll make navy. Okay, so we now have all these different colored buses, and we haven't assigned anything to them yet. All we did was lay out the piping so that we can run the signal to it, right? And then we also have to decide where these go once we're finished with them. So click OK. And we've created these buses, and if you look down at the bottom, when you're dealing with the fixed busing, you'll see that my mains go across the bottom. Let me just zoom in on this a little bit, and you'll see we now have these little patch panel here. So we can say, I want to patch to main two or main one this track, or I can patch to my different submix buses right here if I'd like. Or what we'll do instead is we'll go up to the Fairlight menu and choose Bus Assign. And when you go to Bus Assign, this is going to give you a map of all of your different tracks and your submix buses. This will show you all of your buses up here across the top. If it, when you're working with legacy fixed busing, then you're going to see an M1 and M2 for your mains. The S1, 2, and 3 are submix 1, 2, and 3. Okay, it's just naming. So let's go to main 1, and all of the tracks are running to main 1, which is fine. If I wanted to, though, I could have nothing go to main 1. And how would I achieve that? Just select main one and unassign everything. There. Now if I play, nothing's coming out of any of my buses. There is no signal because nothing is actually leaving the tracks yet. Now what I'd really like to do is let's start with our dialog. And I want to assign just things that go to dialog, only dialog, which would be Emiliana, Philip, Ada, and the room tone. All of those are going to be my dialog track. Okay, done. Now when it comes to my sound effects, I need everything else that's sound effects. So that will be my PFX is production effects, my med lab, drone, and the sound effects. So all my sound effects are now running to this sound effects bus. And the last one is this music bus, and there's only one track for music, so there. Music's now going to the music bus. These are my references, so I don't need to assign those to anything. So all of those are done. The submixes are finished. Now let's go back up to that main. At this moment, nothing is going to the main, and instead of sending every single track to the main, I'm just going to send these submixes, my dialogue, my sound effects, and my music. Those will run to the main. So I can adjust their levels, and all of the signal is going to the main. So if I were to close this and watch, oh, notice here is my here are my different buses. Let's just peel those open so you can see it. And just two hours ago. There's the different buses as needed. And as you can see, my main, and there's my oh, dialogues shit. playing right now. I have sol um, Philip Solo, this reason we're not hearing everything. And now you can see that we have, there's my main, there's my dialogue, sound effects, and music. Now let's go back into our patching again for our bus assignment. And I'd like to do that M and E. So what's the difference between the main and the M and E? Well, I mean, the m and &E has the sound effects and the music, but no dialogue submix. That's the only difference. So those are all patched and ready to go. I can close that up. So now 
I have the ability to listen to any of those elements as I want to, and I can adjust the individual faders for my sound effects if they're a little too loud, or my music if it's too loud, and so on. I have individual faders for those submixes. So the busing just kind of gives you a little help for you know taking hundreds of tracks and narrowing it down to just a few that you can use for finessing when you get towards the end of your mixing. Right up here at the top, you'll see there is my main. Um, and it's, this is what I'm actually monitoring, but I can also switch at any time and monitor now just my M&E. Or I can switch it to my dialogue and then only hear the dialogue or only hear the sound effects or only hear the music. So it gives me a lot of different options for playback as I go or for monitoring. Like I said, that's just looking a little bit with buses. And as you can see, we've been slowly working our way through the different stages of mixing. So the next thing we want to do is let's look at automation. Just take a quick look at things that we can do to automate or to adjust those levels over time. And to do that, I'm going to go ahead and open up a different timeline. Let's come down here to automation. OK. and switch this over. So I'm looking at my automation and what I'm going to do is we're going to just spend a little time on this MedLab track and I'll just add a little bit of automation to that track. Now again, we still have some busing on here and so on. I'm just going to kind of collapse some of this for now. And we'll focus on these tracks. I'm going to select the MedLab track for this example. Make it a little bigger for us to look at. And whenever you want to do automation, here we go. I can turn this on or off by just clicking this button. As you can see, that turns on your automation tool set. And whenever your automation tool set is turned on, you get these controls. Okay. And what automation does is basically you're writing automation or as you change your fader, as you change any controls, it's going to write new information so that you can record it over time. And there are different controls so that it will happen and latch on to every move you make or snap back. Um, and so on. And so all of these different controls you can choose to use depending on what you're trying to do. So for this example, I'm just going to do quickly three different types of automation on the MedLab tracks. First, I'm going to automate the fader. Then I'm going to automate the pan, where it is in a position between the speakers. And the third thing is I'll automate a plug-in so that we can see all three of those. So let's just try it. Um, and along the way, I can kind of show you which um, automation tools I'm using. Now, when you look at the top in your automation controls, you'll see, let me zoom in a little bit, your, your enables. And the way that works is whatever you enable, that's what can be automated. If you don't have anything enabled, then none of those elements can be automated. This just gives you the ability to only work on the things you want to at any given time. So I'm going to start with the faders. We're only going to work on the MedLab effect. Okay, so I need to go find my MedLab track. I'll put these back. Let's go across here and find. There it is. There's my MedLab track right here. This is what I'm going to be automating. So what I want to do is change the level of the MedLabs during playback. So it's a little bit louder at the beginning, and then it gets quieter once they start talking. And that's going to be super easy for me to do. Now, if I look over here, it's in write mode, which means I'll be writing more information. If I was in trim, that would be I've already recorded automation. I just want to kind of finesse those levels. In this case, I'm in write mode. I'm going to set it to latch, which means it, anything I do with my mouse or anything I do if I was on my console, um, it's going to latch on to that movement. And as soon as I release, it will do whatever I need, tell it to do when I release. So latch is turned on. When I come over to this section, it's set for my latch mode. And then on stop, when I let go, it's going to do one of three things. It's going to hold at whatever level I have. It's going to return to the level that was already there or event, which means it will hold on whatever I'm doing up until it gets to the next keyframe or the next piece of automation information for that um, parameter and it will stop. So theoretically, you could just set, if you're just fixing one little section, that's the part that will get adjusted. It won't roll over any other automation you have within that track. So I'm going to go ahead and leave this on hold. We're going to adjust the fader and the fader only. I'd like to see that fader curve, so I'm going to come over here and set this to fader level. And the last thing I want to do is set this particular track to write mode by just clicking this button. That automatically is setting it into write mode. It's ready to record information. And if you look at my fader, 
over on the right hand side, you'll see that the fader has turned red to indicate I'm ready to record automation to that track. So I'll just start playback. So I'm clicking and holding this, and then I'm just going to lower the level a little bit as Philip starts walking across the room. He's watching. Now I'm slowly lowering the level. And I could leave it there if I wanted to. Okay, so that is my levels. Now notice that I'm only hearing my background effects because I have that set right now to only play back background effects. I'll switch this back to my main. So that way I'll hear everything during playback. And there you can hear those different levels. And so as you can see, I've just recorded the automation to that track. Now let's try the next one. I mentioned I was going to do pan. So let's come over to change this to pan. And I'm going to, I'm going to adjust both the left, right, and the front back. Let's open up the pan window so you can see it. Remember how this is sitting right here in the middle. So what I'd like to do is start it so it's on the right hand side of the screen because that's kind of where Philip's head is. And then as it moves across the screen at the very beginning, I'm going to slowly pan it over and then park it on the left. And then when I get to this red marker, when they're at the table talking, I'm just going to leave it back here in the center. So at the moment, it's in the position I actually want it to, to be when I'm done. So we're going to end up right here. And to do that, what I can do is I can actually mark that spot right now on the automation curve for the panning, and that way it will return to this position. So let's go ahead and set that up. I'm going to come up here and enable my pan and disable fader. Then I'm going to come over here, and instead of on stop return, I'm going to go to event. And that means when it gets to any kind of automation, it will stop. We'll leave it set to latch mode. And then I'm right is fine. And then what I'll do is I'm at the red marker where I want the change to be is let's go over to the pan control. And right here in pan, I want to see my left, right, and go ahead and turn this into right mode. And you notice it's sitting here ready for something to happen. Notice everything is turned red right here, right? And what I'm going to do is take this pencil tool and just draw a little bit of automation right there. See how I just did a little scribble right there. So I'm basically locking in that position for my left, right at this moment in time. Okay. I'm also going to switch this over in pan to my front back. I'm going to do the same thing. Got my pencil tool there and I'm just going to kind of scribble a little spot right there. And that way I have set some automation. So it's absolutely going to come back to this position for both front back and left, right. Okay. Then I can come back to the beginning. I'm going to turn off my pencil tool. I don't need that. I'm just going to go back to my arrow and I'll be ready for this to um, do something, right? And so now I can have this uh, make any kind of adjustment that I need to. And so again, just making sure that we have this set. Now, as I mentioned, you mark your setting as you can see, there it is. And if I want to make a change, I'm going to go ahead at the beginning of this and drag it to the new position, which is going to be over here. So that's where it's now going to start. This is where it's going to start. And I can see that both in my left, right and in my front back. As you can see, there's a little bit of difference there in my pan curve. And what I'll do is I'll just start playback. And I'm going to move this as he's moving. I'm automating that position and I'm going to park it right here on the left. They look to the left. So they're looking right there where I have it panned. Still there on the left. It works. He walks across the room. Still on the left. And I can actually stop at this point because it's basically just going to stay in there until I get to that point that I had marked. So there you go. I was able to automate the panner just by setting that one point ahead of time. So those are two. Now let's do the last one. Um, the last thing I wanted to automate is I'm going to turn off pan and let's go over here and do a plugin. Now I haven't actually added a plugin to this, 
uh, the plugin I'm going to use is an echo. And you probably think, well, wow, that's pretty dramatic, right? It's not going to be a heavy echo, just a little bit of an echo. And what it will be is any time we see we're right there next to Philip, MedLab Philip, we won't hear an echo. But any time we're, we're away from him, we'll add just a little bit of an echo. And what that will do is give the sense of, you know, it will be a reminder that he's there, but we also know that we're kind of farther away from him just to show you how that would work. So first thing I need to do is on this track, I'll add a plugin and here's my echo. Now, obviously I don't need a massive echo. I'll go ahead and set this up to a large hall. Okay, there we go. That's our preset. Now, obviously that's going to be pretty dramatic. Do you hear that? So we'll go ahead and leave it sort of dramatic, but my goal will be to adjust this wet dry. And what we're going to do is we're either going to have this all the way dry or wet, one or the other. And so we'll just ride that level. So if he's right in front of us, it will be dry. If he's not in front of us, it will be wet. So let's try that. We'll start with it dry. And I need to make sure plugin is turned on. It is. And I have to come over here and let's choose the plugin this time. Any plugin that I have applied to that track will automatically show up here. It's set to echo. And let's make it dry wet. That is the one control I'm going to adjust in this case. So there we have it. So let's go to the very beginning. Um, and I have this set. I'm going to set it to right mode so it's ready to go. My wet dry is exactly where I want it. I'm just going to watch my screen. I'm in the top right. Might make that a little bit bigger so I can just see it better. And I'm just going to watch it and just ride that wet dry. So here we go. It's dry. That gives us a sense she's further away from him in a room. Dry again, because we're right next to him. Now he's further away. So as you can see, I'm just giving a little bit of realism to the shot. I can stop playback now because we don't go back to another close-up. But as you can see, the combination of those three things really bring this track to life. And this is just scratching the surface on what we can do with our automation. And in this case, I only did it to this one set of tracks. So that is our automation. And those are most of our controls that you would use for working with your mixing. Now, what I would like to do is I'm going to reset my UI layout. So let's go back into work workspace reset UI layout. And now what we're going to do is we're going to come over to the media pool and I'm just going to kind of fast forward to a different timeline here um, and just show you a couple of things like our bus tracks. So although I just showed you automation on one track, something else you could do when you're working with automation is you have your buses will also show up as tracks in the timeline. And this is only when you have automation turned on. So for example, let me hide my media pool and bring up my index. If you look at your tracks index, and let me zoom in there so you can see that a little bit better. If you look at your tracks index, you'll see that in addition to all of your tracks here, you'll see that all of my buses are also showing up here. So I can actually see my buses and automate the bus tracks right here in the timeline. You can even draw in automation if you wanted to. So there's the automation that's been applied to those tracks, which is great. Um, and I'm just going to go to the beginning of this. So you can see I have some automation on those tracks as we had before, but you can also see towards the bottom that there's automation on the, the tracks as well as here on the clips and tracks. Now, one of the things that often happens when you've applied automation is that you may need to move an entire show over a little bit to make room, let's say, for titles. Now, if you have to actually pick up a show that has um, already been edited and you have all of the automation on there and you need to move it over, you want to make sure that the automation moves with your clips. Let me hide my index, make this fit to the window. I'll just reduce this a little bit. And one of the things you want to do if you are moving something that has automation applied is make sure it's turned on because if automation is turned off, then you're not going to know where your automation is and it won't be, it's just turned off globally at that point. So we make sure we turn it on. And then the button you want to pay attention to is this one right here because this is your automation follows edit. And as long as that's enabled, which you can tell I've clicked on it so it's brightened, right there, is automation follows edit, which is the default. That means the automation, if there's a clip in the track or clips in a track, the automation is not only assigned to the track, but it's also 
on the clips themselves. So if you move the clip, the automation goes with it. And I'll just show you an example of that. I'm gonna turn off automation follows edit. And if you watch, I'll move this clip right now. Make this track a little bigger. If I move this over, notice the automation stayed and the clip moved. Well, that's not what I wanted to do. I'm gonna undo that. This time I'll turn on automation follows edit and I'll move the clip and you'll notice that it moves with it. That would also work if I were to cut, copy, and paste it somewhere else. That automation will stay with the clip. So in this example, just to finish that off, I'm going to select everything in this timeline right now. And if I want to select it all, just Command A selects every single thing in my timeline. And as you notice, it's even as selected the automation that's applied to those clips. Now, if I wanted to move this by 10, let's say 10 seconds, well, one of the things I could do is I could just cut everything right now. And I'm going to make sure my playhead's at the beginning just to keep track of it. So my playhead's in the home position. And if I Command X or Control X if you're on a PC, I've just cut everything. Notice it's now a clipboard image. It's a ghost image. And then I'm going to come up to my time code field here. And I'm going to just type plus to meet, meaning move forward 10 and period, which would be 10, 0, 0, 10 seconds. I'll hit return. And notice it just moved everything over and you can see that the ghost image also moved as well. And then I can paste Command V. And as you can see, not only did I move it over by 10 seconds, but I also, the automation stayed exactly where it needed to on this clip. So that's just something to keep in mind if you are automate, working with automation. One other thing that's very useful when you're working with automation and you, you have your bus tracks is check this one out. I'm going to just peel this open. If you look at your main, you will see that in addition to the automation, you can also see a loudness summary right here. If I turn on my loudness history, this is a graph. You don't automate your loudness history, but it allows you to watch your entire, the loudness as you play through on your loudness meter. I can reset, I can start. And if I play this through, which will start any second, it's going to actually record the loudness right there, exactly the same information that's in my loudness meter. I'm going to dim playback. Is you're going to also see this in a graph. And what's wonderful about that is if for any reason your loudness levels are off, instead of just seeing, oh, a red signal on your loudness meters or yellow, meaning you're within tolerance, you can see exactly where it happened so that you can adjust the levels as needed right here in the timeline. So you'll only find that when automation is turned on, notice that if I turn off automation, you will not see it. And it's only gonna be on your main track, main one. Let me turn that back on so you can see it one more time. And I will hide that again. So the last thing is delivery. Of course, if we want to take our finished um, project and actually export it or get it out of our DaVinci Resolve system. So let's go to the media pool. I'm gonna open up one last timeline. Um, there's our mix for stems. Um, right here, I have this timeline we were just working on or something very similar to that. If I am completely finished with a project and I want to export it out, whether I want to bounce the entire thing as a mix or just part of it as a mix, things to think about are if you have automation applied, make sure it's turned on because if it's not turned on, you're not going to hear it. So make sure that's turned on. And then the other thing is, what is my intent? What am I actually trying to do? Am I trying to bounce this entire thing as a single file, a single file? I could do that right here if I wanted to by just bouncing the mix to a new track. You can also do that same export over here in the deliver page as well. So first thing I want to do is let's just say we want to bounce only our dialogue. Say we want to make a mix of our dialogue. Well, our dialogue is all going to what? All of our dialogue is going to a dialogue bus. So we could just bounce that if we wanted to, depending on what our output is. Um, and it's just a matter of kind of thinking through what you're trying to achieve. Let's go up to the timeline menu. And if you look right here, bouncing mix to track, this would be a mix of the entire show. At this moment, everything is available. There's nothing that's been soloed or muted. So let's go over here to bounce mix to track and open that up. And this will let you choose what exactly you want to bounce and where. And bounce again is just rendering out a new file. So if I want to bounce my stereo main to a new track, then that's all I have to do. And I will get a stereo mix of my entire show. Done. If I have a 5-1 mix and I want to bounce that, it will bounce that to a 5-1 track. 
or if I only want to bounce my dialogue, which is right here, my submix, I could bounce that to a new track as well. So right now I'm bouncing my main and my dialogue, and I'll just click OK, and it will create two new tracks. One will be just my dialogue, and one will be my mix. Let's select both of those, and we'll zoom in. And there we have it. That's what I just created in about two seconds, right? And here is my stereo mix of my show. And if I were to listen to this one, this is the dialogue stem. All the levels, everything is exactly as it would have sounded if I was listening to the individual tracks. Now, where did these bounce files go? If I look into the media pool, you'll find them. They all just dumped right into whatever bin I happen to have selected. Once you have created one, you can actually go in there and rename it if you wanted to. You can export it right from the timeline um, give it a name and export it this way, or you can also deliver from the deliver page as well. And for this example, um, let's open a, a different timeline and I'll just show you a way of delivering from uh, the deliver page, but let's open up a different timeline. I'm going to go to this one called finishing start, and that will wrap up our little story on going through the entire mixing process. So at this point, what we're looking at here is stems, right? We've got the entire show. We have the stereo mix, which you just saw how to make right there in the timeline. We also have my dialogue stem, my sound effects stem, and my music stem. So I have all of those have been created very easily just by bouncing out those submixes. I could have created these or recorded them back into a track if I preferred. There they are. Now, something else that I have, though, is because I also needed um, surround deliverables for 5.1. If you notice down here in these lower tracks, and you'll see I have just enough tracks, six channels for my 5.1 surround mix. Let's solo those. So we're only listening to them. Right now, I'm listening to this 5.1 just through a stereo main. I want to change it so I'm listening to it through my 5.1. And notice now it's listening to it that way. Unfortunately, Every single bit of that signal is only coming out through the center channel. Why? Because these are all mono tracks, right? Each of these is a mono clip, and they're all panned to the center. Check it out. You can see that. If I open up my pan window, you can see every one of these is panned to the center, which would be why I'm seeing it panned the way it is. Now, I could manually go in there and repan these, or I could just link these as a group which we've done before. Let's do that. It has nothing to do with selection. It's all done up here. All you do is come up to the Fairlight menu, Link Group, and select that, and it's going to bring up the Link Group window. Inside of here, I can choose any number of these. Of course, I want all six. It's automatically going to ask me if I want 5-1 film or 5-1. I want to have just 5-1, which is going to put that's going to have the center channel will be my dialogue, which is how I'd like it. So left, right, center, LFE, left surround, and right surround. These are all linked together to a single fader, as you can see right here. If I open up the panning, there it is. All the panning is dead on. The only thing that hasn't happened is my LFE is not turned on. I need to turn on my boom. I can even adjust the level on that, which I will manually. And so now I have this all set. I'm getting my surround 5.1 out. Well, that's great, except I actually want to deliver these as separate units. I don't really want them all together. I link them in order to get the panning, but now I can go back up to link group and just select those and unlink them. And as soon as you unlink them, the panning stays. Everything is still panned perfectly for surround mixing. As I play it back, you can see there's my levels. Everything is playing back exactly as I want. I'll just mute the playback. You can see the meters. Okay, I could run my loudness testing if I wanted to, and everything is good. So I have exactly what I wanted right there. Okay, so now that these are set for delivery, I, what I really want to do is I want to deliver everything I have in this timeline exactly as is. Well, let's go over to the deliver page, the final step. Now, of course, many things you can deliver right from the Fairlight page, but by going over to the deliver page, now we have up here at the top, we have all these different presets we can use for audio only. If you're just going to deliver audio, you can go in here and create a custom audio delivery if that's what you want. Or we could be delivering a custom video clip with all of the audio connected if that's what you want to do as well. Let's just do that because we can. 
Um, we'll call this the final hyperlight final. We'll just throw this on the desktop because everything's good on the desktop, right? Um, at the moment, it gives you several choices. Do you want this as a single clip or individual clips? One clip is all we want, single clip at the end. Um, we are going to export the video, so I'll just leave this checked. I'm not going to change anything. I'll just leave all the vid video settings exactly as they are. I'm going to go to the audio settings now, and we have some choices here. Everything I'm going to keep exactly the same, but there's a couple of choices here that might make a difference depending on what you're working with. You may want everything rendered as a separate channel, and if that's the case, you would check that box. If you want to render, dis render discrete audio tracks, you can do that. At this moment, it's only exporting my main. But I can change this at any time. I could say, actually, I want to export only my 5.1 with this video clip, or only, you know, I can choose exactly what I want it to do. I could do individual timeline tracks. If I choose that, then it's going to say, well, which track do I want? My stereo, which track? I could say I want several tracks. I want track one, track two, and so on, and I could do it that way. So you could choose exactly which element you want. All you have to do is look, <laughs> and you'll see exactly what it's doing. Or another option, if I actually had it set up exactly the way I wanted it to in my page, then all I have to do is come over here and say all timeline tracks. And then exactly what I had set up, stereo, each stereo stem followed by the 5-1, all six channels of the 5-1 mix. And let's say that is exactly the configuration that I needed for my delivery. Then I could set it up that way to all timeline tracks and then add that to the render queue and then render that out. And I will get exactly what I was asking for. So whatever it is you're trying to create, whatever combination you need, you will find those choices right here up at the top, including Dolby Atmos, master files, and so on. So hopefully this gives you a, an idea of some of the deeper mixing tools. You've seen what we can do with sound design and mixing, and now you can apply those to your own projects. So thank you for watching.